there. Um, give the Lord praise this morning for being able to come online. This is an interactive um, conference line, and we welcome everyone here this morning. Uh, we want we are excited. This is uh, Sister Gloria. I'm sorry, from Southern Oregon. And um, again, I want to welcome everyone. And we want, we are so excited that we are embarking on a transformative uh, journey through the gospel, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, Pastor is starting with the book of Matthew, and he will be guiding us in this in-depth study, which will also cover... Um, we're starting in Matthew, and he's going to be going through this with um, the Journey series from Tommy Higgle. He has a two-part um, study on the book of Matthew. It's called Journey with the Messiah. There is a discount rate of $17.99 for the set of two, plus shipping and handling. Um, he offers one book. For nine ninety five nine ninety nine um, with shipping and handling, or you can get the two part for seventeen ninety nine with shipping and handling. Um, as I said, Pastor will be going through the four gospels according the uh, to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So Tommy Higgle provides a comprehensive gospel study uh, collection for forty seven. 99 with shipping and handling. This collection includes the four Gospels, as I just mentioned, and um, an additional book on Gospel Harmony. So these are available through uh, journeyseries.org. Um, he has a discount for the collection of the six books, and that collection is under, um, if you go to Tommy Higgle series, it's under discount collection or the library builder collection section. Or an easier way is you can call them at 1-800-635-5346. And I believe I heard that Virginia would be helping you. Um, that is uh, Mr. Higgle's uh, widow. Um, we are looking forward to growing in faith and knowledge together. Um, if you do decide to go with the bundle um, saving at $47.99 plus shipping and handling, um, I believe that by paying with your credit card, there is a um, payment plan. So that way they take a little bit out this month, a little out next month, um, and so on. So I believe that they have a payment plan for those of us that are on a a fixed income, this really helps. So again, you can get one book at $9.99 plus shipping and handling, the set of two of, of Matthew, Journey with the Messiah at $17.99 plus shipping and handling, or the six books at $47.99 plus shipping and handling. So um, with that being said, we're looking forward to this um, study. If you, if you miss any of the recordings um, or you just want to review, you can go to ironsharpens.net, okay? Also, um, if you go there and you're not on our mailing list, please join our mailing list so that in the future you get our future correspondence, okay? So um, tomorrow being the first Thursday, we will be hearing a word from our minister, Myra, out of California. Um, on Friday, we will be having our praise and um, testimonies and prayer requests. And I believe that's for, with um, our sister, Karen. And then um, other than that, we will again want to welcome everyone to Iron Sharpens Iron where we come from the north, the south, the east, and the west to hurt, learn, and we're, uh, hear the word of God together, where we grow together. Um, please keep your phones on mute, although this is an interactive line, and we welcome everybody to join in. Um, 
if you keep your phone on mute when you are not um, contributing to to the line, so that way we can all hear with clarity. Thank you so much. And this morning we will be ushered into prayer by Sister Anne from Texas. Good morning, Sister Anne. Well, good morning, my sister, and good morning to all on the line this morning. Let's gather together, bow our heads, and go to prayer. Go in prayer to God. God, who is our almighty Father, our all-loving and knowing and merciful, merciful Father, forgiving us, Father, for all our sins. And Father God, we just thank you. We bow down before you. We praise this this morning. We praise your holy name, Father God. We come to you with thanksgiving in our heart. And Father, we just need to take a moment. Just take a moment and let our minds and our hearts reflect on what it really means, Father God, to have you in our lives, to have you, to have complete control of our lives, Father God, to have you watching over us, protecting us, guiding us, Father, and giving us strength when we become weary. And we do become weary sometimes, Father God, giving us understanding when we become confused about which way to go, up, down, side, backward. Father God, you are there giving us understanding, giving us peace, Father God, when it seems that all hell is breaking loose, Father God. We need you, Father God. We cannot live this life without you. And Father God, most of all, we thank you for loving us. We oh. thank you for the great love, Father God, that yes. you shut on us. Love us when we feel that no one cares. When we feel that we are even unworthy of love, you still love us. Father God, you love us when we don't even love ourselves, Father God. You are our Father. You are the great I am. And Father, all we have to do is think about how great you are. You said turn to you, pray, seek your faith. And Father God, when we just think about what Jesus the Christ went through for our sake, Father God, all we have to do is think about that one week, Father, from Palm Sunday to Resurrection Sunday, Father God. When we think about the pain and the shame that he went through for us, the innocent Lamb of God, Father God. We can't help but return that love. And that's all he asks. In, in, in his word, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And that was the first greatest commandment. And the second is like it. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And that's all he asks of us. Father God, and we just have to, we, we, we must, we must return that love. We must obey those two commandments, Father God, because we want to spend eternity with you. And Father, we thank you for loving us so we just can't ever thank you enough, Father God, but we, we say thank you today. And we thank you for this Bible study line, where I know I have grown so much, and I'm sure that everyone has grown in your word, Father God, under the teaching of Pastor Doug. And we thank you for him, and we thank you for Sister Sheila. And thank you for all the participants and all the ones who have a presence of mind to get on this line each and every day. Father God, we love you, and we just can't say it enough. And I pray this prayer. In your son, Jesus the Christ's name, amen and amen. And good morning, Pastor Dad. Good morning, sis. We say amen again. We thank God for prayer. We thank you for uh, covering us and keeping us in the proper perspective 
of loving God and loving one another. And so we come in uh, assembled to join in with your prayer. We all come boldly in humility before the omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent living God. And we agree with you, Ann, uh, that God provides the proper pathway of love no matter what the situation or circumstance. We trust and believe that God always has the answer, the right answer, uh, the answer that will lead us uh, to a continual victory. And so we thank you uh, for leading us. We thank you for this time together, this assembly, uh, as each of us brings the light that God has given us to shine forth uh, in this blessed assembly so that iron will continue to sharpen iron. And so I add my welcome, welcome, welcome indeed to all who have come. This is a good place. This is a safe place. This is a growing and a loving place uh, where we come from coast to coast uh, looking to go over the ocean uh, with the word and the truth of the living God. And so I'm excited. Excited, beloved, and I hope you are too. Uh, uh, well, first of all, I'm excited about the word that's going to come forth tomorrow uh, from Minister Myra. Uh, so we're looking for that word uh, that will come uh, from the Lord as we continue in prayer, praise, and testimony on Friday. And then Monday, uh, we are going to start our next journey into this gospel of God. Uh, so Let's all make sure that we're prepared and we're ready. Um, I have a question to Gloria, though, because uh, she talked about the online uh, ordering as journeyseries.org, and I have journeyseries.com, so I need to know which one it is. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry, Pastor. I thought it was .org, and I do not have his book in front of me. Actually, this is Minister Brenda. Actually, it's both. The link that I sent out says .org and it will go to .com. So it is actually both .org and .com they have. Thank you, Minister. Hey, amen. Thank you, Minister. So you can't go wrong. <laughs> no, you can all roads lead to what's right. <laughs> right. So, the so easiest, we bless God for that. <laughs> Easiest way to call the 800 number, they're right on it. They will send it out in two days. You get a private or email. A lot of the participants have already gotten their books and have uh, emailed me to let them know that they have them. So, yes. Amen. Amen. So, I agree with that. And that number again is 800 635 5346. And speak with Virginia. She is uh, the widow of uh, Reverend Higgle. And she wants to make sure that the word that God gave him continues to grow. So she gets it out. I agree 100%. Yeah. Now, as you order, those who have not ordered yet, I recommend the Spiral Bound book. Um, they have it in different ways. I recommend the Spiral Bound and the King James Version. They have it in a couple of versions. And, and anyone would be okay. But I recommend the King James Version uh, and the Spiral Bound book book. Again, uh, that number to reach Virginia is 800-635-5346. Um, and so uh, we want to be prepared next week to begin our journey, uh, our journey uh, into the gospel. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are angelos. They are messengers of God. Uh, because they have presented to mankind the gospel, which is the good news. It is the good news of our salvation in Christ Jesus. Now, they are also evangelists, uh, because the actual word for gospel in the original language is evangelion. Evangelion uh, means good news. Uh, and so when we speak the evangelion, we're speaking the good news. Uh, and this original word evangelion, uh, which means gospel, that's where we get the term evangelist from. Uh, and uh, Sheila Banks, 
uh, the first lady of my life, is going to bring us some information about this term uh, that we use now, uh, evangelist. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, they are Angelos, and they also are evangelists because they bring us the Evangelion, which is the gospel, uh, the Evangelion, which is the good news. And so uh, we want to discuss who truly is an evangelist on today. And so uh, Sheila, Sheila yes. B., <laughs> would you give us some information on uh, this term evangelist? Sure. What exactly is an evangelist? Um, I looked it up, and um, uh, I'm taking this from some of the writings of Billy Graham, who was a great evangelist. An evangelist is like a newscaster on television or a journalist writing for a newspaper, except that the evangelist's mission is to tell the good news that never changes. The primary responsibility is to preach God's word telling people simply and clearly what God says concerning his son, Jesus Christ, and what he has done for all. This is done with urgency because the souls of people are at stake. Evangelists are not just are not to just tell people about the Bible. They are to proclaim Jesus and communicate his message of salvation. In the days before email, Western Union telegrams were the most effective way to convey an urgent message. The messenger's sole obligation was to carry the message to the person to whom it was addressed. He may not enjoy doing it if the message contained bad news, but he was faithful to deliver it. He dared not stop along the way, open the envelope, and change the wording. His duty was to deliver the message. This is the duty of the evangelist. God has given the message and the evangelist is to be faithful to every word. The evangelist's effectiveness depends on clear and authoritative, authoritative I think that's how you say it, uh, preaching of the gospel from scripture. God said and Jesus spoke are the authorities. Not I think, we believe, or our, ch or our church teachers. God's word alone is the authority, and it is more powerful than human personality or natural speaking ability. The Bible is always living, active, and, re and relevant. Uh, the Hebrews 4.12. Itinerant evangelists are the most important ambassadors on earth, and it, and it is not a calling just for the clergy. They are a mighty army. Spending out, spreading out across the world, the world with a vision to reach their own people for Christ. Uh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> this is the end. Amen. Amen. This is the end and the beginning. Um, any questions, comments, or concerns uh, to Sheila? Sister Gordon, I want to say thank you. That was a very clear um, and under uh, to understand what an evangelist is, and we are evangelists if, uh, if, when we share God's word and truth with others. Thank you so much, my sister. Amen. All right. Um, question. If an evangelist uh, brings forth the good news uh, of the salvation that we found in Jesus Christ, uh, can one be an evangelist without love? No. 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 No, I agree. God is love, right? And what Jesus did as the suffering servant of God was to demonstrate for us uh, sacrifice and service, the agape love of God 
involves a sacrifice and it involves a service. It involves giving. Um, you cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ. And I'm not just talking finance. I'm talking about who you are and what you're about. It's in, it involves giving. It involves sacrifice and service. It involves unity, not division. It involves love, not hate. You cannot truly be an evangelist of Jesus with hate as your primary focus with division as your primary method of operation and uh, with lie as your primary proclamation. The, the evangelist must speak the truth of the word of God and it must be based in love. Our God is love. And so it's much easier to know that an evangelist is truly an evangelist when you can look at them and see the love of God. When I look at a Billy Graham, I see the love of God. Uh, he is a true evangelist. Uh, all of the preachers, teachers, and, and Christians that you see, that's the criteria by which you need to judge if they are true evangelist is the word true according to god and it is and is it love okay any other comments questions or concerns about uh an evangelist pastor this is minister brita this is minister brita there's an office of the evangelist and then there's evangelism that we all are supposed to do, but there's an office. The the office is created by mankind. That's the okay. that's a church tradition. I believe Sheila mentioned, uh, and she's absolutely true. Uh, not because my church says so. That's not what fosters an evangelist. Uh, church tradition. We need church tradition. Don't get me wrong. It's good to have custom, it's good to have traditions, it's good to have some structure to stand on. That's absolutely true. But that is not God. Uh, because my church says so doesn't make it God. Uh, because uh, we've created an office that we call the evangelist doesn't mean it's God made. But that's what we're getting to here. We're getting to the fact uh, like uh, Sister Gloria said, that it is from God. And your church can create the office if they want to, but will it truly be an evangelist? Well, it depends on a couple of things. Is it love? And is it set on the word of God? Is it directly the word of God? And is it grounded in love? And my church can designate uh, Joe Billy the, an evangelist, but I can look at Joe Billy and I will determine according to the word of God whether that is an evangelist. We must not get stuck in what my church says or what tradition has fostered. We are based completely in the word of God little Susie on the back row that never speaks up much at all can be a truly, truly be an evangelist in her walk and in her talk and in her giving and in her caring and in her concern and in the love that she shows the mankind as she goes. That can be more of a true evangelist than evangelist Billy Bob who has the office designation Sitting on the podium. So, in essence, um, what we're saying is, it's not necessarily what the church says. Is as we follow the word of God. Because when in Ephesians four and eleven, when He said He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, it's the anointing that you have been given 
the gift and that you have given to uh, continue the work of God. Um, your church may not recognize it, but you still do the work because you love God. Absolutely. Thank you. And that's what Jesus told us all to do, to go into the, all the world and to spread the word of who he is. Right. Amen. Amen. And so we're not uh, we're not cut out by someone else's designation. We are to follow uh, and be grounded in the word of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit. And I'm just putting out things that make it easier to recognize. One, is it love? Is it love? And is, is it in agreement with the word of God? Because you can be in agreement with the word of God and without love and you are not an evangelist. You can be loving uh, without the word of God, and you're still not an evangelist. And so what we're talking about is someone who is in agreement with the word of God and through the Holy Spirit of the living God, leading in the love of God. Amen. Just Reverend Harris. I just wanted to add to what everybody has said. I think that the absolute, everybody is absolutely correct because I know I have preached from my pulpit as well that, you know, when you look up at this pulpit, you are not looking at an angel or somebody that's above God or somebody that's better than you or somebody that's better than anyone else. Preachers and pastors and teachers, we're just, we're just, that's what we are. Evangelists, preachers and pastors and teachers. We're, we're just human beings just like you. And I, I, I find that in a lot of places they make the tradition, the, 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 the like I said, the traditions of men, they, they celebrate the pastor as if he is God. And and that's why I always try to be clear. And let people know, just because you see somebody in a robe or in a collar or whatever, you have, like I say, you have to watch and listen as well. And if you know the word of God, you know what they're doing and what they're saying because too many people put that on pastors as if, as if, as if they are they are God and they are not. I know I am not. I don't know about anybody else. But I know I'm not. But I thank God for giving me the ability to go out and teach and preach. But I know that I'm a sinner saved by grace just like everybody else. There's no mistake. God knows what he's doing. Amen. And that's the benefit of iron sharpening iron. Uh, we are studying the word so we will know. And we are uh, joined together in this blessed assembly so that we can uh, help one another grow in the grace of God. Uh, anyone else? Good morning, Pastor. This is Karen. So if this is not necessarily a, uh, the, the, as Minister Brenda calls it, office of evangelists, if this is not necessarily a uh, uh, church given office, how, or how, are, how are evangelists, uh, who, who does the designation then, I guess is what I'm trying to say. To you know, designate someone as an evangelist. If there's if if uh, a pastor doesn't stand up and say, "Oh, this individual," or the Lord told me, I guess is what I'm saying, that this person uh, is an evangelist. How does that come about? Thank you. Well, that's a very good question, and the answer is, if the pastor is correct, then that's the true designation. And I'm not saying pastors are always going to be incorrect. They are most often going to be correct. Uh, so pastors certainly have the ability to recognize and designate. Uh, what I'm saying is that it, that's not the only way, and it's not always right. So the designation, the, to answer your question, Karen, the designation comes from God. I'll say again, the designation comes from God period, full stop. And so if a person uh, is trying, if a person is a mother Teresa, she's an evangelist, whether she calls herself an evangelist or not. Uh, the mother of the church sitting, uh, helping and serving and, and causing people to come to Jesus Christ out of her pure love and caring is an evangelist, whether she calls herself an evangelist or not. We are not to be uh, so concerned with the title than we are the actual work 
of an evangelist. No one uh, during the time period called Matthew an evangelist or Mark or Luke or John, but they are, or Paul, but they are as they brought the evangelion. They just brought the good news to people, and that was their concern just to bring the good news and to show the love of God to others. So whether somebody anoints you uh, as, as, quote, evangelist or not is not the issue. It can happen, and it does happen, and many times it is correct, but that's not our bottom line. Our bottom line is what God has ordained, uh, and we can know that by a couple of things. Is it love? And is it according to the word of God? The Bible says God makes evangelists, uh, preachers, teachers, missionaries. God does that. And so if God knows it and you're doing it, that's all that really matters. Thank you, sir. Okay, so we're going into the gospel, the gospel, which is the good news, the evangelion. It is the good news of Jesus Christ, uh, who has saved us from our sins. Uh, and so let's begin by asking this, how many gospels are there? One. There's only one gospel. Jesus Amen. Amen. There's only one gospel, and we, we must keep that in mind as we go forth. There's only one gospel, one, and that is the good news of Jesus Christ, and we will see it presented in four different formats uh, by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I just want to take a couple of minutes this morning to look at how these gospels begin. They begin uniquely. And we are able to learn a great deal uh, uh, from each of these four uh, different presentations of the one gospel. Uh, when we uh, begin uh, reading them, we learn something about the author's intention. We learn something about the literature that they have written. And we learn something about who Jesus is according to each author's point of view. Each author uh, designate from their own life, from their own perspective, from their own leading of the Holy Ghost. And so when we paint them all together, we get a more full uh, appreciation of who Jesus is and how uh, he presents himself to the world. Uh, we're going to start with Matthew. Uh, he authored our first gospel. Of course, they are all led by the Holy Ghost, we understand this word comes from God, and these men have been chosen by God to bring forth this good news. So uh, we will begin next week with Matthew, uh, and Matthew calls his gospel a particular thing. Would somebody read uh, Matthew 1 and 1? Matthew 1 and verse 1. This is Karen from the New King James, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sis. And so Matthew starts out his gospel by letting us know that it's a book. And as we get into it and see the two different uh, 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 textbooks, 28 chapters, <laughs> we're going to see that it is a book. But Matthew tells us that this is a book, and, and it's a book of the genealogy of Jesus, so that we will know that he's the Messiah. We'll get into that. So you'll know that he's the Messiah. It's the genealogy, but it's a book. <laughs> That's the kind of literature Matthew writes from. Now, would somebody read uh, Mark, then, how Mark introduces his gospel? Uh, someone would read Mark chapter 1, 
uh, verses 1 through 3. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. This is been this Go ahead, Ann. Go ahead, Sister. I will read it. Thank you. From the uh, NIV, uh, Mark 1, 1 through 3. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of the calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Amen, the word of God. Amen, thank you. And so what we see here is different than Matthew. Matthew lets us know, I'm writing a book, and you're going to read this book and learn something about the Messiah. Matthew uh, has a very different introduction. He says... Uh, uh, Mark has a different introduction. He says, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so as we go forth, you're going to find out that Mark is actually the first gospel written. It's the second gospel in your Bible, but it was the first one written. And so uh, Mark is actually the beginning. It's the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then he tells us what the prophets have proclaimed uh, in preparation to this uh, man. And so uh, what Mark writes is an evangelion. And it, it, it started a whole new type of literature that did not even exist before uh, because he spoke of evangelism. So that's what we find in Mark. Mark lets us know uh, that this is the beginning, the beginning of the gospel, the good news, of Jesus Christ. It changed literature. Changed literature in Western civilization completely. Uh, anyway, that's Mark. Mark lets us know that this is good news. Uh, now, when somebody reads the beginning of Luke, Luke uh, 1 through 4, Luke 1 verses 1 through 4. This is Minister Brenda, and I have it. And I'm out of the New King James Version of the Bible. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of these those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, what that you may know the certainty of those things in which you are uh, were instructed. Instructed. Amen. Word of God. Amen. Thank you, sis. And so Luke, uh, he's a doctor. Dr. Luke writes literature. He lets us know that he's writing a, a orderly account. Uh, an organized, uh, orderly account of something that's very, very important. This is proper literature. In fact, in the original language, everything that Minister Brenda just read is one sentence. It's one sentence uh, in the original Greek. And so Luke has set forth to write uh, an orderly account of proper literature of this good news. Uh, and so we see the direction he is coming from. Um, now, would somebody read John? Look at John 1, uh, verses 1 through 5. John 1, verses 1 through 5. This is Gloria. And we have John 1, 1 through 5 in the King James, and it reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was nothing, was not anything that 
was made made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The word of God. Amen. Amen. And so John, this is the last gospel written. John uh, writes his gospel as a declaration. He doesn't get into, well, this is literature. He doesn't say, well, this is the very beginning. Uh, he doesn't uh, go into any kind of human uh, construct. He goes all the way back to before humanity and makes a declaration. This man is God. He is God. There's no title. There's no name. No introduction. Just in the beginning was the Logos in the original language. The Logos. Uh, and during John's time, uh, when they saw that word, the Logos, uh, they know that the Logos was divine creative energy, that the Logos was the force and power of the whole universe. And so John begins by saying, you want to know who Jesus is? Well, I'll tell you, he's the Logos. He is the word of God. Uh, just before we close this out with somebody here in John. Also read for us uh, verses 14 through 17. John 1, uh, verses 14 through 17. John is declaring. This is a declaration. This is Marin. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received. And grace for grace. 17, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And so um, this is uh, what we have. We have a book written by Matthew. We have a gospel written by Mark. We have an orderly account uh, written by Luke. Uh, and we have John letting us know that in the beginning was the word, a declaration. And so this is the perspective of the four uh, evangelists. And so when we put it all together, we get a complete and full picture of the one gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to do a quick reading uh, by Dr. Minka Sprague, uh, and then we can close for the day. Dr. Sprague. She writes that uh, we were given this gospel in order to see that there is justice in the creation. We ought to see that the poor are not hungry, that the marginalized are cared for, that the prisoners are set free. We ought to love God and our neighbors as ourselves. We ought to celebrate our anniversaries as the people of God. And we ought to let God be God as creator and redeemer of the universe in which we find ourselves. Uh, our name is the chosen people, the people of God. And this name describes us not as individuals, but as a collective, corporate, communal body. And I'm going to stop there and say, iron sharpens iron. And then she goes on and writes, as God's people, we were led into the promised land, taken in and out of exile, and given a Messiah in answer to our prayer. And as a people, we have been given the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is incredibly unique. Uh, nowhere in the New Testament does the Spirit fall upon an individual. The Holy Spirit is poured out upon two or three who are gathered in the name of Jesus. This means that in the life of the resurrection, the Holy 
spirit always relates the faithful to one another. And I'm going to stop there, beloved, to say that we are related to one another. We are family, faithful family in God. Uh, she goes on to write that it relates the faithful to God, that there is no other spirit or power or principality or energy or God in the Greek world or the Hebrew world that behave like the Holy Ghost. And as we become God's children in the power of the Holy Spirit, we also become sisters and brothers within the family of God. And so we are one in the Spirit, and we are one in the Lord. Praise God for Jesus the Christ, uh, bringing the good news of our salvation not only for now, beloved, but even forevermore. Would someone, well, any questions before we close? If not, uh, would someone pray for us? Here. Father God, we say hallelujah. We say hallelujah to the name of God, our Savior, our Redeemer. Oh, yes, he came as a babe. Yes, he did. But he will come back as the warrior, as the king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is not dead. He is our king. He is our savior. He is our strong tower. And Father God, we thank you. We thank you for being in the family of God. We thank you for the sacrifice, the sacrifice that was made on our behalf, that we may be free, that we may be free, that we may love one another as you loved us. Father God, we thank you for this study. We thank you for this deep dive. And we are so looking forward to continuing our study in the life of Christ and who we are in him. Thank you, Father. Thank you. We love you. We love you. We love you. For to Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen and amen. Amen again. Thank you, Kara. Be blessed, beloved. Amen.